Hi, I'm Larry Digno with Constellation Insights, and we're here with Kent Nolson. He is VP of Digital and Emerging Media for the Seattle Seahawks. Hi, Kent. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Larry. How are you today? Good. So I guess walk me through the project with AWS and what kind of pain points you were trying to solve. Yeah, so I think as we headed into this year, a little bit of background, you know, we produce a lot of video content. So we have a really talented video production team that, you know, throughout the course of the year, we'll, we'll publish well over a thousand different videos throughout the course of the year. And what we saw as kind of a pain point was, you know, as we get those videos from our video editors and video creation team, distributing those videos out was just becoming a very time consuming process. And so we spent some time this off season saying, hey, how do we how do we improve that? so we can increase the time to publish as well as just provide more content to our fans. And so we had an opportunity to, to work with one of our partners in AWS to identify how do we do such a thing. And so we worked with them and you know we use a ton of different AWS products. We use AWS Media Convert to make sure we're encoding the videos to be the standards we want. We're using AWS Transcribe for transcripts. We're using Amazon S3 to host a lot of the videos. But we're excited this year to use AWS Bedrock and be able to use some of the Gen AI products that they have inside of that, that environment to really kind of provide some automated artificial intelligence to the actual videos that we're distributing to save time and just kind of allow us to get stuff out a little bit quicker. How, how big is your team? I mean, I know it's like a media operation within a yeah. football team, but how big is it? Yeah, so my team is 11 full-timers, plus we have some part-timers. My team is comprised of half, which is our digital content team. And then we have a digital platforms team, which is they oversee things such as our website, our mobile application, email, kind of anything that we own and operate ourselves. Okay. So you've been through a few tech, technology cycles because you've been with the Seattle Seahawks for a while. How has the digital engagement involved in terms of platforms you need to hit, where you need to reach fans? And, and just, you know, what I guess what's the touch points before and after based on your tenure? Yeah, so I've been here a while. So I started in July of 2007. And at that point in time, you know, I joined the organization and really all we had to worry about was a single single website and a little bit of email that we had done at that point in time. And, you know, over the past, you know, 15 plus years, we've really grown dramatically. You know, we're to the point now where we have, I believe we're at just over 10 different websites that we manage, as well as we oversee 70 different social media channels. So it's constantly growing. There's not many things that have been kind of added to the rotation in terms of platforms and stuff that have come along that I've left. It just tends to be growing and more and more of our brand and business is being exposed to the internet. So obviously you have to do press conferences and things like that, but what about player content? I guess what, what kind of video is being ingested through this? We have this system in place and we're kind of using it as a starting point. So we're really focused right now on our media availability and our press conferences. And so that's throughout the course of the year, we'll do 300 press conferences throughout the course of the year. And those are both our coaches as well as our players. So, you know, before the game, during the week, as well as after the game, after hopefully a win, our coaches and players will talk. And so we ingest all of those components into this system and do all kinds of various things, including a Gen AI analysis that we have. Um, but that's just today, you know, we're looking at moving things forward to add our podcasting to this piece as well as slowly add on the rest of our video workflow. I think it's important for us as we kind of move forward to make sure we do so, so we can, you know, train the AI and make sure we tune it because every video is, you know, a little bit different. So we kind of started with the press conferences and seen a lot of great success and exciting to kind of move it forward and do some more later. How fast has the turnaround been with gener generative AI? You've been working with AWS on the generative AI stuff for this season totally? Yeah, so we started it right before our preseason started. So we started in probably mid-July-ish, somewhere in that range. And what we're seeing now is, you know, a process that used to take us, you know, by the time a video was delivered by our video creators, the time it was published, you know, it could take upwards of, you know, 30, 45 in case in some, some extreme cases up to an hour to get a video published and all the various things that need to happen to it. We're now in a situation where once the video is submitted, you know, we'll have it all the way through the end in about, you know, I would say in a worst case scenario, about 10 minutes. And that includes doing all kinds of things that would take us hours before. We're translating into German, we're translating into Spanish, providing a 
our a gen ai summary that kind of provide more information about the video that maybe can be a little more robust than we can currently do now we're distributing that to our various platforms we're making sure we resize it we're distributing it to various media partners all those things are happening within just a few minutes which is which is awesome so obviously time's a kpi here what are some of the other kpis you know you're you're looking at now and and also want to track as this goes forward yeah i think time time and and you know Human savings does make sense. You know, we'd like to have our people that are doing stuff thinking about new types of content to create, not necessarily pushing bu buttons to publish something. So that's certainly a huge piece for us that we're seeing you know benefits with right now. Moving forward, I think a huge piece for us, and we're really excited to learn more. And you know, we're still a little early to to understand what the data is. Is that you know, with the Gen AI summaries that we're providing for at least our press conferences right now, we can provide much more in depth information that hopefully as our fans use the various platforms to search for our content can find and discover content in unique ways so we're really excited to see how our search engine referrals and various components are improved by providing some much more rich metadata that they can kind of analyze and um, be able to get what they need to find so i, I guess along the metadata front the archive video I think opens up a bunch of opportunities for, you know, mini documentaries. If you wanted to be, mm -hmm. if you want to dive back, you know, go way back to the day where Jim Zorn was a quarterback or whatnot. What what's the opportunity for the archive video and, and, and what kind of tagging and, you know, what do you think is possible there? Yeah, I think that's a really exciting thing that we're kind of really looking at exploring now for the future. You know, we have done a good amount of work over the past couple of years to take old beta tapes off the shelf and put those in and kind of digitize those. But, you know, we don't have a lot of real good data on all of those. And so we're working with AWS right now to figure out, okay, how does our video team, how do they take those videos, process them and get a lot more data about who's in the video? What did they talk about? You know, if there's any data or information. So potentially in the future, we're saying, hey, yeah, we'd really like to see a Jim Zorn video from this time about him talking about that. We can do so within you know a couple of seconds versus right now it's kind of a little bit of let's hopefully it's on this tape or this video file and just kind of do a lot of manual scrubbing so it's really exciting as we move forward and kind of um, have some opportunities to talk about our history in the future about what we can do there and and how are you thinking about the models like i mean you're working with amazon bedrock so you have a choice of models I guess, how are you thinking through which models work for what and fine tuning and all that? Because I imagine that archive video, the video archive yeah. is probably going to need a different model than what you would do for transcription or whatever. How, how do you think through that? Yeah, it's a really, really great question. I think, you know, frankly, I think it's something we're still kind of learning ourselves and how we do. So, you know, when we started this process of where we were, you know, we put a couple models to the test and kind of, you know, analyze them based on the quality of the output and what we were able to the outputs that required the least amount of human intervention i should say and you know it even took us a little while now you know we're in and you know, we started with kind of one of the anthropic models and it was working pretty well but you know the moment we upgraded to another model we kind of really got to the point it was like hey we've got it and we feel like we have a really good product so it definitely took us some tinkering and some kind of understanding about what makes sense and what doesn't i mean i think the you know, the tremendous thing about Bedrock is just how many different models you can use there. And, you know, obviously we have a very unique you know, circumstance, but, you know, if I worked in a different industry that maybe Anthropic wasn't the right one, I'm sure there's another one on there that you can use that's more tuned to what you're looking to do. And the swapping the models, is that just a few clicks or is there some fine tuning you have to do on your end? Yeah, it's, it's literally a few clicks, right? I mean, I think, you know, when we worked with, you know, a really talented development team to kind of put it all together, they... They built it in a way that, you know, theoretically, if I wanted to go switch to a different model right now, I would go in there and or whoever would go in there and click a couple buttons and make some config changes and we'd be going and I would be shocked if it took us more than 10 minutes. So it's it's pretty exciting to kind of see how easy it is to change. And that was something when we kind of built the process. We knew these these models are all changing. I think that's one nice thing about Bedrock is we're not stuck into using one model. Again, the model we're using now is really great, but you know, for all we know, if some other model comes along here in six, seven months that we want to change over to, part of the scoping of our developer was to make that really easy, and it's it's very easy to do. Yeah, I mean, at the current pace, by the time we get to the Super Bowl, there'll probably be at least three or four, three or four more foundational models to play with for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we've 
that was definitely a huge piece of moving forward. And um, I said, we're, we're really happy with what we have now, but you know, the one nice thing we've seen about this project, at least in my team, I can't speak for our whole organization, but my team is just kind of starting to show people what they can do with some of these models and start to kind of really get to the wheels turning for people to try new things. And how do we kind of, you know, maybe improve an efficiency somewhere so we can actually devote more time to something that maybe is a little bit more important. How did you think about where to put the humans in this process? Yeah, I think the way we, again, we started this process, our goal was to make the people on, on my team, my teammates, have them focus more time on creating more content, coming up with new ideas, less on what I would say kind of our more data entry tasks or kind of stuff that can be a little more automated. You know, a lot of the pieces are still very important. You have to make sure you format things the right way and have the right text and all that information. But in doing so, it was important for us to make sure we're enhancing what they're able to do and allow them to focus to be more creative versus focusing maybe on a process that's a little bit more, you know, data entry specific or kind of a little bit more not more monotonous potentially. So does that mean the humans are more like the ideation phase and then, you know, at the end to make sure it all, you know, lines up? Yeah, as it currently sits today, we still have a human that kind of looks at it and just says, yep, this all looks good and hits, hits basically hits publish. And what we're finding is over time, more and more people are, we're getting to the point where people are, you know, getting to the point of hitting publish more than having to make an edits. And so we hope we're to the point now where we're close to 100% on that and we can kind of let the AI publish on its own. But right now it's kind of just an approval and then a feedback loop to say, hey, you know, this is this is a particular thing that we need to change right you know one thing for example as we were setting up the model is you know spellings of names are very different you know we have player names that are maybe a little more uncommon and so we were noticing early on it was a little difficult for the AIs to kind of spell things properly and so we really worked on ingesting our roster before every video it looks at every one of our roster to ensure that a, the latest players are on there. So if it makes a reference for a first name, it knows who that is, as well as it makes sure it gets all the spelling correct and making sure everything is as correct as it should be. So that's almost a weekly chore, right? In terms of updating players? Right now, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't make any roster decisions, so that's definitely outside of my area. But yeah, our coaching staff is constantly <laughs> well, changing the roster. roster decisions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It, they're constantly changing it and you know again we have to update our roster on our website so it gets into our mobile app we have a content management system we use but the moment that that's published you know it is available for the ai so the next time that that ai system is making a summary or summarizing something it'll reference that roster in real time so we don't have to remember to go update the model it's just saying hey every time i'm going to do it i'm going to go check the roster i'm going to learn the roster and then provide the summary so it's kind of just built into the the prompt that we're providing the, the ai how long did this take from pilot to production like when did you did you start like right at the end of last season or, or i guess when did this start when this started I mean, as an experiment yeah i think you know again we're, we're talking a lot about the aws piece and there's a lot of components that have been a part of this it kind of took us I would say we started it probably in late spring and got to the point where we're kind of the point now where we have all the components built on. We launched that before the regular season started, so in early September. So it took us about two months of kind of adding pieces and you know iterating and making sure we move forward. And you know there was definitely a fair amount of you know kind of going back and tweaking things, but it was more about understanding like, hey, how do we how do we adjust the model to kind of fit our needs as well as making sure that we're using it in the correct way. Okay. So at the end of the season, this will be successful if what's what's the KPI or, or what's the- uh, Yeah, I think the, the, huge, the, huge, the huge benchmark for us is just really improving, improving our operational efficiency. So if we're able to sit down and say, hey, what's the time savings we have? You know, with 300 press conferences, if we're able to save 20, 30 minutes of press conference, you know, we've got, you know, was that 150 hours or so of extra time that our content creators can be with creating other things. So that's currently the main focus of what we have is improving that. So we can, you know, just do more things, contribute more content that our fans are are deserving to have. On the flip side, you know, we're really looking at just how are we able to kind of just expose our content. You know, again, by providing more detailed descriptions and providing more detailed information, 
are we able to get fans to our content and get them to what they're looking for a little bit quicker? All right. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you.